Hey Health Junkies, it's time for The Health Fix. Join your host doctor, Janine Krause, as she gives you a dose of what you need to know and do right now to take control of your health from the inside out to rebel against aging, look damn good, fight stress, and laugh every day. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Kraus, and today I have Lee Little with me from Canyon Hoops, and we are going to talk about hula hooping and why you need to rethink the hula hoop and how you need to think about maybe incorporating that into your fun exercise, especially as you get older and thinking about menopause and how to stay fit and how to get rid of that little poochy belly that starts to develop because working that belly with the hula hoop can make a huge difference in your life, just saying. So, Lee, hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Hello. And so we are dying over here at the Health Fix to know how you got into hula hooping. Oh my goodness. So my hoop path has definitely not been a linear journey. I started working with the hoop as a rhythmic gymnastics more than 30 years ago. Um, to give you some context, I'll be 45 this year. And rhythmics is an Olympic sport. It combines dance and gymnastics, and it incorporates the hoop, the ribbon, the ball, rope, clubs, and floor. And at the time that I was competing, they had one size hoop for gymnasts, I believe. And I was so tiny, it came up to my chest. It was the most challenging event for me. And I remember when I retired from the sport, my parents asked me, do you want to keep your hoop? And I was like, um, no, I, mm -hmm. I can't stand that hoop. Mm -hmm. And I packed up and saved everything else, but I was happy to dump the hoop. Mm -hmm. And so fast forward 30 years, I had always stayed with athletics, always, but I just never went back to the hoop. And so I was walking with my two kiddos to the park, and I just stopped mid-stride. There was a hoop dancer she was in her own zone. She was in her own world. She was spinning on her front lawn, and I just was mesmerized. It was mm -hmm. different than anything I had ever done in rhythmics, and the next day, I ran out to get a hoop, <laughs> and I started learning hoop tricks, and I practiced every day. Um, now, you have to keep in mind, though, that e even after years of daily practice now, I would not consider myself a hoop dancer or a hoop performer. At my core, I'm an athlete and a problem solver, and I, I promise this will come into play later. Okay. Um, but I practice every day, and there was one trick that became really critical in my hoop journey. It was a trick where you start to move your hoop from your waist up to your chest without the help of your hands, all done with core manipulation, and I could not get this trick down. But I noticed something as I worked it day in and day out. My obliques were becoming pretty defined. And because of my background as a fitness trainer, I really started diving into this because we're taught you can't spot reduce. And right. so it started me on this completely different path. Even though I was working with one hoop, then two, and then up to six, my real passion was in answering one question. How can I use a hula hoop to activate deep core muscles? Because there's a very real difference in just getting a hoop to spin around your waist and act, actually activating the transverse abdominis, the obliques, the rectus abdominis. So, so that's me. I'm a hoop geek. I love diving into research, testing, refining, you name it. Oh, my goodness. That deep core muscles thing is huge because when I'm looking at low back pain, when I'm looking at pelvic floor issues in my office, because I work with a lot of pain folks because I do acupuncture, and a lot of trigger point injections, things of that nature, It's we find that more often than not, nobody knows how to engage, especially the transversus abdominis, but really, no one really knows how to feel their core. They suck their, they, they try to suck their belly in and try to bring that, you know, when you're in yoga, they're always like, bring your belly button to your spine. I would venture to say that probably nine times out of 10, when I tell people to try to do that, nobody knows really how to do it. So you are exactly. an amazing component here of getting folks to feel their belly. It's, it's incredible. And I, I feel like mastering the 
belly breath is critical. And one of the things that I've seen, I've even spent some time working with, with kids in preschool, is that they learn, they lose that ability mm-hmm. to breathe through their belly early. I mean, it's happening as early as four. And so when you fast forward and you're trying to get people to reconnect with their core, it can be really difficult at first. And, and maybe we should even back up and tell people what the transverse abdominus is. That's a very because good point. Because I think there's a lot, you know, a lot of people that don't know what, what are we talking about. And it's, it's that muscle group that you feel when you have a huge laugh or a huge coughing spell. You know, and you're like, oh, my stomach hurts. That's what you're feeling. You're activating those deep core muscles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a very long, I mean, it's, it's a horizontal muscle that, you know, a lot of us don't think about it like, as it is one of the deepest ones. And yeah, I, I think, you know, for a lot of people, just even, you know, feeling that muscle is, is such a cool thing. And so yes, laughter, um, such a great time to get that muscle going and, and those deep belly laughs. Now, thinking about hula hooping, deep belly breaths. I'm thinking all of the stress reduction components with hula hooping and how that works into, you know, working with folks who are stressed out. Um, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Have you? It's huge because it helps bring down those cortisol levels. Yeah. It seems to be kind of what's going on with everybody this day and age. So <laughs> right. tell me this, do you have, um, wh- when you have people coming in and, and, and by that, I mean, coming to your website and they're going, okay, I need a hula hoop and I'm trying to figure out, you know, how do I get started here? And, you know, I want to, I want to just get started with, with hula hooping. Cause I think for a lot of my patients, when I, when I tell them, you know, let's do a balance routine, let's do a parallel at bar you know, let's do a fun workout versus think about the conventional, let's go to the gym. I think a lot of people think first about, well, what if there's not one my size, just like you mentioned. So when people are coming to your website, what will they find in terms of sizing for hula hoops? That's a great question. And and this is one of the biggest problems that I see with people that are getting just started is sometimes what will happen is they'll do exactly what I did, which is they'll see some form of hooping, whether it's hoop dance or uh, waist hooping, and they'll run out and get a hoop from a drugstore. That's a smaller size hoop. It's a lighter size hoop. Uh, the one that I got even had water, which was absolutely horrible. Oh. Um, and then they'll give up on it. And so the, the only reason that I didn't was for two reasons. One, I already knew how to waste two. So it's kind of like riding a bike. And two, I'm really, really small. I'm like the size of a child. So, you know, me buying a child hoop was not a disaster. But if your average height or your average build, then trying to work with a, a child hoop or a drugstore hoop is like trying to put on your toddler's swimsuit. It's just, it's a terrible fit. And so... The, the first recommendation that I make is you need to start with a hoop that's made for adults. They're larger in diameter. They're heavier. Uh, they spin slower. And that and a hoop that's spinning slower is going to give you a lot more time to learn proper body mechanics. Ah. You can always go faster. But the, the key is you want a hoop that's going to start to spin a little bit slower so that you can get those push points down, whether you're pushing forward and backward or whether you're pushing side to side. And so that's the reason why we say, all right, you need, you really need a hoop that's made for adults. And that's key. When I take hoops to people and they try them for the first time, I give them a light hoop and it just falls down. But the second we give them a bigger hoop that's made for adults, they're like, wow, this is amazing. I think that's important because I think a lot of people when I'm when I'm talking about having fun and doing hula hoop because I actually do talk about hula hoop in my practice um, because of pelvic floor muscles and because of yes the transverse abdominis but a lot of people yeah they're like I couldn't even hula hoop as a kid so there's no way in hell I'm going to be able to do it now as an adult so I love that you're pointing out that the heavier ones actually are better for adults. Now, it's, it's interesting because when you start to talk about weight, then you think heavier is better, right? So mm-hmm. there's this great debate happening centered around how heavy your hoop should be. Ah. Um, I even wrote a blog dedicated to this one topic because we've had so many questions centered around this one question. And let me say this too. We're not talking about a huge difference. 
in terms of hoop sizes and weights. We're talking about, you know, a few inches and maybe a half pound difference that, that gets people hung up. And it's honestly the wrong question. The right question is, how can I use my core to make the hoop spin and not have the hoop do the work for me? It, it's kind of like arguing over the effectiveness of a five pound dumbbell versus a seven pound dumbbell for bicep development, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure the weight is your deciding factor there. It's gonna be your nutrition plan. What else you're doing with your bicep curls? What does your hormonal profile look like? So to, all of that is to say a hoop between one and a half and two pounds is a really good starting place for almost every adult. And you can always progress down to a lighter hoop. And with those hoops, are these, are, are you getting, so the waist hoop versus the, the body hoop, would someone want a different hoop for, for both purposes if you wanted to do body hula hooping versus waist hula hooping then? So that's a, that's a really good point. Your, your hoop that's designed for fitness is typically going to run a little bit heavier, like I just mentioned, between, okay. you know, one and a half and two pounds. Okay. It's, it's because it's a really good starting point for waist tubing, and it's sturdy enough to help you with balance exercises, with strength training exercises. So using that hoop as a prop for squats using it for some shoulder work because obviously you're not going to want to go too heavy and so that's a really good place to start now when you start talking about um, i want to spin the hoop around my around my palm or around my legs or over my head and do tricks then you're you're going to want to go lighter obviously you're not going to want to be spinning a one and a half or two pound hoop around the palm it's it's incredibly taxing on the shoulders and your hands. I can imagine. So as you talk about more of a, you know, a piece of dance equipment, yeah, a, a lighter hoop makes more sense. Okay. That makes sense in terms of what someone will be thinking in terms of which way to go if they were trying to figure out, oh, well, you know, for exercise, heavier weight is better. Now tell me this, what do you, what do you use for the weight? What, what is the ingredient in the hoop to give it the weight? So it's, it's basically the tubing. Oh, You're okay. talking about the diameter of the tubing and how thick the tubing is. There's nothing inside, particularly at the hoop, that gives it that weight. It's, it's the size of your hoop, how big it is, the thickness of that, that tubing. Mm. And, you know, the other thing that I'm seeing that people have made a mistake on is they'll go for something like a, a knobby hoop, hoops that have knobs on the inside that are, I think that they'll say they stimulate the core or they massage. I mean, it's painful. It's painful. It's, you're not going to get core activation from a knobby hoop or a wavy hoop. And so a hoop that's very smooth all the way around is going to be your best bet. Good to know. Things that I would have never thought about at, <laughs> at all. And, no, you know, the knobbies, I don't even think I've seen those. But I have... You know, when I've asked different friends who have hula hoops, some of them, and I don't know what trend it is, is that there's corn inside them um, or, or things of that nature. And I don't know what that means or why it's inside there. Um, I've just had people tell me, oh, yeah, I have corn inside my hula hoop. And I'm like, oh, okay. Don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, the only thing that I can think of is to increase the weight of the hoop. Mm. But, again, it's, it's almost like riding a bike with training wheels. Mm -hmm. So. If the heavier you go, the bigger those training wheels. I mean, eventually you want to take those training wheels off so that you're able to spin that hoop with these tiny core movements that are firing off those muscles, not from the weighted hoop and a slow spin. Okay, makes sense. So to add, to add more weight onto it doesn't necessarily solve the problem of really firing off that core. And if you've already got back problems, right, and you're adding poor body mechanics and a weighted hoop, that's that's not going to get you where you need to go either. No, no. I feel like that could cause much more problems. Much more problems. Now, in terms of an ex, like if a beginner was to do a hula hoop routine, so for exercise, what does that look like? How, how does it play out? How... How do you go about a full routine? 
So I think it depends on why somebody picks up a hoop, right? So mm-hmm. some people I've seen really love hooping because it's a great stress reliever, like you mentioned. It's a mm-hmm. mood booster. And I got to be honest, like depression, anxiety, um, addiction, mental illness all run in my family. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it was a really important tool. That's how I manage my stress. That's how I manage my anxiety. I can put on my headphones, blare my music, and just rock out and be in the zone. And so we, you have people that really just want to kind of hoop around their waist, spend 10 minutes, get a pretty good fun workout. They're feeling happier at the end, and they're good. And, and for them, that, that does it. You have other people that are looking for kind of a complete fitness tool. Mm -hmm. So it might look something like on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they spend time hooping and just kind of rocking out, being in their zone. And then on Tuesday and Thursday, they use the hoop for strength training exercises Mm -hmm. and balance work. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very, very versatile piece of equipment. That's so cool. Now, do you sell workout programs like in terms of how to incorporate it into a weight training type of thing or you know basics in terms of step by step how to hula hoop just for folks that maybe never even tried hula hooping before in their life yeah so we've got several resources <clears throat> we have a three-part video series that teaches people how to waste hoop and it take, walks them through troubleshooting. So I, I, t- I take you from, you've got a hoop, you've never hooped, here's how we're going to start it. <clears throat> Excuse me. To, all right, you're having problems with the hoop. Here are the five most common things that I've seen when people are having trouble keeping the hoop spinning. So we definitely have that resource available to people. Um, I did collaborate with Canyon Hoops a few years ago, and we created a hoop fitness DVD, which also has a how to waste hoop, but it takes it further, and then includes a strength training component and a cardio component, and then an additional ab component in there as well. And then I have a lot of resources on the blog, too, that I can include maybe in the show notes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, your blog is quite extensive, and I think it's great for, for the podcast listeners to know that, yeah, Lee has an amazing blog that talks so much about how, you know, really hooping and fitness and, and also just, yeah, stress management, having fun, because I'm finding more and more, you know, as I get older that, you know, I love the gym, but not everyone else loves the gym. And sometimes I decide I don't want to go to the gym. And then it's like, I I will find that I want to play. And and it's this funny thing. I'm like, oh my gosh, here I am in my 40s going, I want to play. And so in my office, I have a soccer ball and I, you know, I I play. And so I've been going, I just want to have a couple of days a week where I play. And I think hula hooping is now going to be my next thing. But I will admit that I am one of those people that was never great at hula hooping. So I am going to have to take one of your courses because I think I need to know some basics here. I'm missing out on Oh, that. that's fantastic. So one of the things that we started talking about in our conversations before this podcast was really getting it out there to ladies um, who are in the perimenopausal stages, over 40, trying to figure out fitness and, and trying to figure out, you know, some new horizons in fitness because I think all too often and and I I have a beef about this and I always kind of get I, I get sad for for a lot of my patients they'll come in my office and, and they'll be like yeah I, I ran you know for my fitness for most of my life and now I just am too tired to run and now I just am gaining so much weight and I don't know what to do and, and this is like every week in my office and you know, I think about hula hooping, I think uh, about a lot of the balance and the stress management components and the core. And, and I keep thinking to myself, you know, this is a great way for ladies to get a heck of a lot better workout than busting their butts doing cardio mindlessly for hours. And so I wanted to 
about yeah. that a little bit in terms of the menopausal component. And I know you had questions for me. And so I think this might be a good time to segue into that. What do you think? I love it. You know, and maybe if we could include a little bit about the estrogens too oh, yeah. and, the, and the benefits of hula hooping in that arena too as we go through this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one of the first questions you asked me about was perimenopause and, and how that incorporates in. And you had said you're 45. I'm going to out myself. I, I'm 40. I just turned 40 this year. And I have noticed a lot of changes with my body in the last year in terms of having trouble recovering from some of my workouts. I will admit I do, I do CrossFit style workouts and they're starting to wear me out a little bit. And I'm going, okay, I'm starting to notice I don't recover as well. Starting to notice that my belly is a little bit more soft and fluffy than it used to be. And perimenopause, I think, is on the horizon. And you were kind of asking how long does perimenopause last? And I kind of thought to myself, well, that's a really good question because technically it could last for a while. Um, some females could almost be perimenopausal for five, six years in terms of what I've seen in my practice. And perimenopause in terms of hot flashes, in terms of insomnia, mood changes, all of that, unfortunately, yeah, it can last um, about five to six years in terms of what I've seen, some people 10. And just for a little definition for the folks listening out there, when you go from perimenopause to menopause, that is one entire year without a period officially puts you in the classification of menopause. But also, I take it a step further in terms of looking at the labs. And so you were telling, you were asking me about estrogens and how estrogens play out here in terms of exercise and fitness. Ah, estrogens. Where do we go with this? <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorite topics. Yes. Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting because there's a, there's three estrogens out there. Um, estrone being our inflammatory estrogen. Estradiol being our most useful estrogen, as I call it. It's the one that keeps our wrinkles away. It's the one that keeps our bones strong, our hearts healthy. And it's the one in charge of keeping the exercise um, on point and our stamina on point. And then we have estriol, which is a little bit weaker of an estrogen and really, its main job is to help with vaginal dryness and, and lubrication. It kind of helps keep us nice and, and lubricated. And so when I'm thinking about exercise and estrogens, you know, as we get older and we start to drop in our estrogens, when I look at labs, I will always look at all three of those that I just mentioned right now. And I look at total estrogens as well to kind of give me a picture as to what's being um, broken down into fractions, if you will. And unfortunately, what I end up seeing in the perimenopausal stages is that the females who are having more symptoms in terms of mood swings, in terms of having some slight hot flashes, maybe some night sweats, but they're not consistent, is that there's a lot of estrone, inflammatory estrogen, floating around in the system. And estradiol is starting to slowly drop, as is progesterone. And Progesterone tends to be almost more of a problem sometimes in the perimenopausal state because progesterone is a hormone that its precursor molecules can be made into cortisol. And so if we're stressed out, we steal our precursors to make progesterone and turn it into cortisol. And what progesterone does for us, its main thing is to help us sleep and keep us sleeping, but it's also what I call the control of the bitch switch. And I'm sorry for oh. those of you out there hearing me say that word right now, but I don't swear very much on this, but in terms of progesterone, it is great for, for tampering or dampening that irritability switch that seems to just be, you know, all of a sudden just like, boom, there's smoke coming out the ears and, you know, the claws are out. And, and so what I see in the perimenopausal stage often now is if a lady is a lot more stressed, that progesterone is going to be quite low, estradiol is going to be dropping as well, and there might be a lot of when a period actually comes that, you know, 
two weeks before the period, so after ovulation to uh -huh. the start of the period, that withdrawal of estrogen, so estrogen is starting to naturally drop so that progesterone could rise, but there's no progesterone to rise, this is when that switch turns on and the moods start to get out of control. And if we can keep the cortisol in check at that time frame, we can have that drop off of estrogen not being as big of a deal and have a balance of not stealing so much progesterone to make cortisol. And so this is like from mid a cycle to start of the cycle, best time to hula hoop. Um, if you want, if you're thinking like in terms of management of symptoms and, and you're not thinking anything about fitness, this is one of the best times that I have people really, you know, focusing on having fun and goofing. So just to jump in there, when mm -hmm. you were talking about like how do I use the hoop for a complete fitness program, mm -hmm. because this goes along with some of the research that I've done that says the last two weeks of that cycle do exactly what you're talking about, which is more of the stress management and hooping for relaxation and enjoyment. But it means that those first two weeks of the cycle, you can focus a little bit more on strength training and interval work with the hoop. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Um, that would be how I would be thinking about this too. And, and how I do typically with my patients, I'm like, okay, you, you want to do CrossFit, you want to lift heavy. Cause I do tend to see quite a few Olympic lifters in my practice too. You know, you want to be looking at where your period's at and if it's starting to get irregular, okay, then we need to kind of be monitoring symptoms. But if you still have somewhat of a regular period, those first two weeks, that's where you're strength training. Those second two weeks, that's where you're not pushing it too hard. You're not like going out for your, you know, 12 mile runs just for fun, or you're not, you know, getting on the treadmill and cranking it up. That's when you're goofing off and having fun with it. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this question because um, Part of me, I, I mentioned that I'm a problem solver. I just, I delve into, dive into a topic and I just, I don't let go until I have answers. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me into the nutrition side mm -hmm. of things. And so here's a question. What do you think about um, using foods to manage the cortisol levels, to manage the stress, to manage the inflammation? And then how does that impact, impact the estrogen levels? I love using food. In fact, you had sent me over a message about the, the bioidentical hormones or, or hormone replacement therapy, otherwise known as HRT. And I, if I can control all perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms with diet and exercise, the, you know, even just diet exercise sometimes doesn't even have to be the word in there. I call it more like playing around, channeling your inner five-year-old for some people if exercise is a trigger word. But if I can control with food, I'm going to do that hands down because it's absolutely, we have a broken food system. Let's put it that way. You know, that's no secret. But no, nobody, nobody's probably going to argue with me on that one. But we have so much Franken food that a lot of people don't even realize they're eating Franken food because half of the quote health foods um, that are out there are not healthy. And one of the things to kind of go back on for hormones and especially in my world of working with my patients is I first get the gut on point and a lot of people who have gotten to the perimenopausal stage in life have you know either a couple kids or you know they've worked themselves into you know a higher end job where they're stressed they've got maybe they're taking starting to take care of their aging parents and and there's a real big habit now of wine at night and it seems to be there's a winery uh -huh. everywhere. And you live in the Portland area, correct? Correct. And so, you know, just outside of you, it's like like where I live here in the Tacoma area. Anywhere that there is open land, there's a freaking winery. Um, it's like we don't even have parks anymore. They're going to find ways to put a winery in them. Um, but what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that we're trashing our guts. And this whole, you know culture of hitting up the alcohol pretty hard because we think that one glass of wine is going to help our cardiovascular system. Yeah, it may, but you're trashing your gut at the same time. And when you trash your gut, you're messing with your hormones. And one of the big things about diet is the more Franken foods we eat, the more we destroy our, our ability to absorb nutrients like we should and things of that nature. So when I'm working with ladies, 
on balancing hormones, I'm always going to work on the gut first and try to get the gut lining nice and strong, try to take care of something called leaky gut, try to kill down a little bit of yeast, kind of balance out the good bugs um, to help with hormone signaling too, because those bugs and the, the good bacteria, the bad bacteria, the yeast, they all kind of play together in terms of your hormone balance as well. And the way they do that is they might let our body convert a little bit more estrone. And estrone being the inflammatory estrogen, this is not the estrogen you want hanging around in high quantities in your body. You want your body to be driven towards holding on to estradiol. And to be able to have estradiol, you need to be eating certain foods at certain quantities. I think a lot of people, we get into the perimenopausal, menopausal state, and we start to freak out because our belly might be pooching a little bit, and we're going, oh my God, I can't eat any fat. That's the devil. We go back to like what we learned in by from our parents and from the 80s. We go right back to that. Like It's instant, like, okay, I'm not going to eat nut butters. I'm not going to eat avocado. You know, and we're like, okay, I'm going back to the 80s. Um, cabbage soup diet. Right, the, the, fat, the fat-free snack well revolution. <laughs> That's hilarious. I'm glad someone else knows what those are. I was talking to one of my patients before. I'm like, what's a snack wall? I'm like, you don't know what a snack wall is? Oh my God, I ate like boxes of them because they were low fat. Um, they were so That's healthy. what my mom brought home. Mm-hmm. As soon as the low fat craze hit, we had fat free snack wells every week in the house. Heck yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like, oh gosh, yeah. Those little chocolate and oh gosh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Where did those go? No. Um, they turned into something, they morphed into something even worse. Um, but but that's the thing. The food the food is important. And and when I treat my hormone balancing with food, I'm not using soy. Um, I'm not a fan of soy whatsoever because it's too manipulated in the US. I, I don't think, you know, all those studies in Asia and mostly Jap- Japan, um, it's a different soy. We have jacked up soy here. So your soy latte is not going to save your hormones. Um, Flaxseed, yes. Chia, yes. But I sequence because a lot of people will go, oh, chia is healthy. Flax is healthy. Pumpkin seeds are healthy. They boost estrogen. But they do it every day. And even though someone's going into menopause or might stop um, a period, I cycle. Even though someone hasn't had a period for over a year and they're in menopause, I still cycle first half. You know, I do 15 days on of flax, chia, pumpkin seed, and 15 days of the tahini, sesame seed, you know, paste or sesame seeds, and sunflower seeds. And two tablespoons ground, that's the standard dosage of that to try to help balance. The other thing is eating as closest to nature. If it's in a box or a bag and there's ingredients you can't pronounce, doesn't need to be in your diet. And, you know, am I perfect? Do I have ice cream? Heck yeah. My best friend was in town this last week and we went to Molly Moons in Seattle. I'm not going to skip those things. I'm just not going to buy a tub of ice cream from there and take it home. So then it becomes habit. It's more, this is, you know, a special occasion kind of thing. And I think for a lot of people getting the mind right about special occasions and treats versus eating thing, you know, making habits of eating stuff they shouldn't have in the house over and over again. Well, I think that's key because one of the one of the reasons that I see, in addition to the mood boosting, that people come to hooping is what you were talking about. I've got a little bit of this extra belly weight or a lot of extra weight that I'm carrying around my my middle, and I really want it to go. And what's happening is there's this disconnect, right, between the exercise and then the nutrition component. Mm-hmm. And so right now I'm working on this course that's that's directly related to hooping and weight loss. And I was asked the question, well, can't you release it without the nutrition part? And I said, I can't. I mean, in good conscience, I can't. I cannot do it without addressing the nutrition piece. Oh, no. Because it's not a complete picture. Absolutely not. Anyone in, in our realm, and especially in fitness, they say over and over again, you know, what you put in your mouth or diet is 80% of your success over and over again. And I've, I've tested all those limits with snack wells and everything else I could possibly test. <laughs> I, I what, have to, I mean, we're, we're our own guinea pigs, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I have been experimental one since, gosh, I can't tell you for how long, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, no, know, it's crazy. Here's the, I have a question about gut health. Yeah. Because some of the research that I've been diving into, there's a correlation between um, the makeup of the gut microbiome and 
exercise. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on how exercise affects the gut health? Because that was one of the first things that you said is I, I want to get the, get the gut right. Yeah. Yeah. Gut health and, and exercise. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of different realms in which you want to think about this. Now, first off, in my practice, I work with everyone from some higher end athletes all the way down to like never worked out, you know, couch, couch potato. And if we're, if we're going in some of the higher end athletes, I want to talk about this first, then I'll dive back down. So anyone who's been running marathons for a while, or anyone who's been, you know, doing triathlons or, or any type of, of sporting competitions, whether it's weightlifting, et cetera, there's going to be strain on your gut with any of these longer duration workout types of, of sporting events. I mean, that's why marathon runners have accidents. I mean, they have little number two accidents because their gut lining is becoming stressed. And it's no different stress in the higher end running a marathon stress to the gut than it is for folks who are couch potatoes who are under a lot of stress from, say, work or family, or life, or past traumas, whatever it may be, it just happens slower on the folks who aren't the, you know, running marathons or, or training for something every week, and whereas the folks who are training for something every, you know, minute they get, it, it's a faster process where you see the immediate results of accidents and bathroom visits, and what it is is the gut lining needs glutamine, an amino acid, that is like its core amino acid. It also means proline. It also means leucine. Um, your branch chain amino acids, if, if you're familiar with those, those guys are helpful to maintain your gut lining just as much as your muscle. And so there's that side of it that a lot of people aren't training for their stressful days. And so I do believe in, in working on giving your body the proper nutrients to keep your gut lining healthy. And whether it's taking an amino acid type of supplement like the L-glutamine, which by the way, I will say is probably my favorite because it's simple. There's also a product called Mega Mucosa that I like um, from a company called Microbiome Labs because it's more of a well-rounded um, product. And then there's the old school bone broths and, and drinking those and making soups out of them. I can't even drink them by themselves. I'll be honest, I have to make soup. But these type of things help to nourish your gut lining. Then you got to work on the gut bacteria. And the gut bacteria, those guys are a little bit different of a beast because we all have different bacteria in our gut based on how we eat. And, and that being from whether we eat junk food all the time or whether we're eating certain types of oils or certain types of diets. Like the keto diet compared to a low-carb diet compared to a vegan diet, you're going to have different gut profiles in terms of your bugs. And for some people... Let's face it, you know, we keep hearing all this like vegan's the way to go, but it can really mess with your gut bugs and so can keto. I've seen way too many people on keto, then they come off of keto and now they have the wrong gut bugs and they're eating too many carbs and the, the weight just, you know, skyrockets up. So in terms of maintaining your gut, it's the greens, it's the veggies. And, and really I'm trying to go back to it. I can't, I guess I can't like stress it enough eating closest to, as to nature, screw these fad diets. I mean, we know we need to eat fruits and veggies, but like really it, it does make a difference because it changes your gut bugs to make them be more effective to help with burning calories. But not only that metabolism, you know, is, is the end point, but also working on balancing your hormones and your neurotransmitters too, your serotonins and your dopamines, because that's a whole nother factor in perimenopause and menopause is if your gut's trashed in the moody stuff, that can also be on that end, it's not all progesterone, like I was saying, in terms of the, the bitch switch thing. That's really fascinating. It's the guts. I'm a geek in the gut. Anyone who's listened to my podcast before, I, I talk about the gut as kind of being the, the root of all evil, but the foundation of figuring, you know, ourselves out. <clears throat> It's kind of this double thing. And the same thing goes to, to being pre-diabetic and diabetic. I have seen over and over again in my practice, I don't have to put people on metformin, which is the most common um, diabetes uh -huh. medication. If I change their diet and give them some herbs to help balance the gut bugs, shockingly enough, their blood sugar will go down. But the diet, back to that 
80, you know, 80% of your success as a diet, it goes back to the food. And the same thing goes for all my patients in my practice when, you know, I'm working with menopause. I will not, I, I feel like I don't get the best results if I can't get somebody to change their diet. So talking about <clears throat> menopause in particular, we talked a lot about the perimenopause. Yeah. How does the, what does the landscape look like for menopause? And, sure. and what, what recommendations do you have during menopause that would be different than perimenopause? Good question. Yeah, menopause, what we typically tend to see in menopause is that all the hormones are going to start to, to go down, testosterone as well. In perimenopause, I don't see testosterone dropping as much unless someone's extremely stressed or they've had two things, multiple traumas, and, and it doesn't have to be significant traumas. It could just be multiple things like lost a job, lost a partner, broke up with a partner, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so in, in, in post-menopause, I'm seeing testosterone being quite low. I'm seeing all of the hormones except for estrone will flux based on the person um, and their dietary habits um, and drinking habits. And then progesterone is going to be low too. And the worse someone is in terms of perimenopause and low hormone numbers, the worse postmenopause is going to be. And so taking care of yourself in perimenopause bodes well for entering menopause. But the landscape changes in terms of now, I don't have a lot of hormones to work with at all to kind of manipulate. Now we're just kind of working on boosting everything. And this is where I tend to use more herbs and food in this case. I love black cohosh. It's underrated. I mean, we talk about it. If you look at any blogs, you'll see it. But you'll you'll look at like the most popular supplements for menopause are Siberian rhubarb, like Astro Vera and things of that nature. But black co cohosh, when used right, can be extremely useful. Vitex, which is known as chaseberry or evening uh -huh. primrose, those guys can be extremely useful. And so when someone is in menopause, I tend to keep focusing on diet, keep focusing on gut, but also add in some tonic herbs as well because there just needs to be a little bit more oomph in that department. And exercise for boosting the testosterone can be amazing. Um, testosterone is one of those interesting components because testosterone and, and hormone and, and not hormones and estrogens are coming off the same precursor hormone known as DHEA. And to keep DHEA in check, you got to keep your stress in check because DHEA can really skyrocket. And usually for females, it's going to open the valve wide open to estrogens. And it's not usually going to be estradiol that we're going to make in menopause. It's going to be estrone. And the more weight you're carrying, the more you're going to have inflammatory estrogen. And so a lot of times in my, my ladies who are postmenopausal, that are having a lot of issues with weight and a lot of issues with mood, I sometimes will consider doing a liver detox and clearing out estrogens in terms of balancing the profile. There's something called diindylmethane. Have you heard of that? Can you say it again? Diindylmethane, DIM for short. Yes, yes. So dim in postmenopausal ladies is great. In perimenopausal ladies, I can cause it, it seems to cause some trouble, and and by that I mean sometimes we have breakthrough bleeding and, and weird things happening. But postmenopausal, I love it because what it's doing is it's changing your ratio, and and it's helping to kind of get those fat cells to dump some of the inflammatory estrogen because estrone is linked to cancer. It's also linked to having. Uh -huh you know, aches and pains and, and fibromyalgia and things of that nature. And in a backdoor method, I would be on this, I would talk forever about geeking out on that, but I'm not going to go there. But the, the short explanation is with the postmenopausal, I'm really working to try to clear the estrone out based on what I see, because not everybody has really high, but nine times out of 10. Um, and then really working on the herbs. And so I cycle the herbs, like I said, 15 days, like I was saying with the seed, cycling, I'll do the seeds. So chia and flax or pumpkin seeds ground, two tablespoons of whatever one you want to use, along with black cohosh in the first 15 days. And then I will go to second 15 days of having Vitex, 
which is chaseberry or evening primrose. Sometimes I do both. It all kind of depends on your patient and how severe symptoms are. And then I'll be doing from those second 15 days, I will be doing tahini, sesame seeds, or sunflower seeds, um, two tablespoons. And so just take it up a notch with my menopausal folks in terms of support. I love that. And maybe for our listeners, we can put together in the show notes the schedule mm-hmm. of what that might look like in terms of um, the supplements that you're recommending and the type of exercise, depending on where they are in their cycle mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I can so do that. Another trend that I'm seeing that I wanted to ask you about is, is I have at least two friends right now that are getting ready to have a hysterectomy. Mm-hmm. Are you seeing an increase in this? And if so, what are some things that people can do to combat that and avoid having that happen? And and how does that change the landscape in terms of the type of exercise that we should be doing? Oh my! If God. if someone has had a hysterectomy. Sure. Let's start with the pre-hysterectomy first, and then we'll <laughs> go to the post. Um, because oh boy, yes. Prehistor, you know, like if I could gauge that someone's going to have a hysterectomy and then get them into my office and do some pre care, oh, it would be like a dream world. I usually don't always have that that luxury unless I have a patient who knows that that's happening and comes in specifically to ask me for that care, which is, you know, I'm always giving them gold stars. But if so, let's go back. Yes, you had said, are you seeing an increase in hysterectomies? Yes, it seems like it's just like when in doubt, we can't figure out this dysfunctional bleeding, let's just pull it. Because it's so common for females this day and age to get getting close to 40, over 40, all of a sudden there's a period every two weeks or they're always spotting. And, you know, of course we're looking for fibroids and things of that nature. And then the first thing that you know, really is offered is either ablation or let's just take it all out. Um, And I am starting to see more commonly that the ovaries are left, but uteruses are taken. And then it's okay, we'll we'll let those ovaries try to figure it out on their own. And all all too often, they don't um, figure it out on their own because they were dysfunctional prior to and that's the problem. We're not looking at the, you know, the core here. And so Usually for getting someone ready for a hysterectomy, I'm working on boosting their iron stores because usually they have had so much time prior to of dysfunctional bleeding. That's most of the time. Usually if someone's not getting a period, they're not going to complain to the gynecologist and there's not going to be an issue. But usually hysterectomies are provoked by either extreme pain because of endometriosis or some type of dysfunctional heavy bleeding. And so Getting ready for hysterectomy, I'm typically having ladies work on iron-rich foods like spinach and blackstrap molasses and oats and black beans and things of that nature, and also really working on the balance, like I said before, about the seed cycling, because sometimes that too can help uh, immensely just to get the seed cycling going, even though they're like, well, I get my period every day of the month. It's like, okay, great. Well, let's just pick a cycle, and sometimes I cycle it with the moon, and we just pick a program and try to, you know, have the body get some t- sort of, of balance there. Now, the other big things with nutrition and prehysterectomy stuff is getting the, the right fats, getting the right proteins in. I think ladies, you know, going back to all of us that are in this 40s, you know, the snack walls again, we're all, in the back of our mind, we are all programmed to think that low fat is the way to go, even though we know better, we've heard all of the information, but there's that little voice in the back of the head that the first thing you're going to do to try to fix things is pull everything that's higher fat. And and in that, we, we mess with the balance of our fats. And so fish, a lot of people either, you either like fish or you don't. There's some people that are kind of halfway in between, but either eating fish and I'm talking about things like halibut, salmon, the, the higher fat, mackerel, you know, sardines even. I'll admit I do not eat mackerel or sardines, a full disclosure. I, I grew up in Chicago. <laughs> Fish is hard for me. And so I'm going to I'm gonna be fully on it. But I do love salmon and halibut. <laughs> love it. Um, but getting the oils right with, in that department can go a long way because once you have a hysterectomy, and say you have a full hysterectomy, meaning we take out your 
your ovaries and your uterus. Well, now you're going to have some changes with hydration and keeping hydration in your skin. And the more good fats you have going in and the more good fats you have stored, the better. Sugar is a biggie. Get that out or minimize it. And like I said, I had ice cream this weekend. Once in a while, sure, but like not as your every night habit. And by the way, wine turns into sugar to sugar alcohol. Does you know no good in the long run? Am I going to say I've never drink wine? No, I mean, I do once in a while, but it's not an every night habit. And, and that's one of the biggest things for a prehysterectomy. I do a detox with the ladies. And shockingly enough, I've gone through some good detoxes with folks. And, I, and by this, I mean liver. And this is two, cabbage, two cups of cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, or beets, mix or match, and some milk thistle. And sometimes I've had ladies not even need a hysterectomy. And it was, you know, this is like two or three people. I'm not talking a huge population. I've been in practice 11 years now. Um, but I've seen it where it's just the liver's bogged down and doesn't know how to clear out extra hormones. I've seen weight loss prior to hysterectomies make a huge difference to the point where, oh, maybe you don't even need it. I've also seen um, getting rid of Teflon pans and not microwaving plastic. And by that, I mean Lean Cuisines. Lean Cuisines, Amy's, pre-made, you know, it's organic. Yeah. And you just uh -huh, microwave uh -huh. something organic and plastic. Um, those plastics do make a huge difference. And so that's where I focus on prior to the hysterectomy. I do a good detox. I work on beefing up the good fats, the right protein. And when I say right proteins, I'm meaning if someone is not vegetarian, we're talking about grass-fed, grass-finished beef, and we're talking about hormone-free meats. Most people are kind of on board with that, but don't completely understand, I think, in terms of what they're supposed to be reading on that label. Same thing goes with eggs. I think eggs are like the biggest confusion in the universe if it says organic but nothing else you're wasting your money if it says cage free okay well what is the, you know you you gotta look and see if they have any more information for you on cage free and then pasture raised is kind of the biggie and so i'm looking at that too like making sure people are cleaning up in their diet in that department and then of course the veggies the more veggies you know copper to a fruit and six to eight cups of veggies it sounds crazy but that is where I'm working with folks in terms of the pre-hysterectomy. Post-hysterectomy is a little bit of a different ball game. All of kind of the same things in that department because now we, we don't have the problem in terms of something that, you know, the, the uterus causing bleeding. But post-hysterectomy, now we've still got the same toxic body. So... I pretty much do the same thing, except the post hysterectomy. I'm also adding in the seeds and herbs to help with balancing the system. Sometimes in post hysterectomy cases, I will use Chinese herbs. I'm also an acupuncturist, so I do tend to use the Chinese herbal side of things too. And that would be my biggie on that one is, is using something in that department because I found that people get hysterectomies and then like two Two months later, you know, it seems like the first month after the hysterectomy, everything's okay, and it seems like everything crashes in that second month. So really prepping prior to is huge, or getting a hold of them, like, within the second week after the, the hysterectomy. That's so helpful. I just feel like this is a topic that we just, you know, even among friends, we don't talk as much about, right? Even though in similar age groups, we're probably all experiencing something similar, Mm -hmm. But it's just not talked about, even in the perimenopause stage, right? How many, how many of your friends are actually comparing notes about early symptoms? Not many, not many, unless yeah. you, you know you just happen to like mention something and then it comes up. But no, you're not like texting each other, calling each other. And I think, yeah, speaking of texting, I feel like texting now we text each other and don't actually have conversations like we used to. And I think that's starting to isolate women too, in terms of being able to talk about their symptoms. So important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, the hormone stuff. I, you know, Oh my goodness. I, I wish I would have, my mom's deceased. I wish I would have talked to her a lot more to kind of get a, a little inkling from her a little bit more. So I'm almost kind of using my my knowledge of what I'm finding out to try to, you know, 
put the pieces together for myself too. I did have that conversation with my mother a couple of weeks ago. Did you? And I did because I just, I was, you know, a little bit of history because I was a gymnast growing up and my body fat percentage stayed pretty low. I didn't start my cycle until almost 17. Mm -hmm. So I was really, really late. And then I remember my mom had a hysterectomy and I couldn't remember what happened with my grandmother. And so I, I just said, Hey mom, you know, at what age did you go through menopause and what happened with the hysterectomy? And, and, you know, there's some things that I'm finding with myself, like you mentioned sleeping through the night and, mm -hmm. and that's one that's come on lately where I'm not sleeping all the way through the night. I'm waking up at one or two mm -hmm. and you know, the grouchiness, you know, the mood swings, like, Oh, what is happening? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I did have that conversation, but I feel like we don't have it enough to say, oh, okay, well, maybe. And, and my mom liked her wine, and she, at, for most of her life, was a smoker. And it did not pay as much to nutrition or exercise. And so, you know, I'm hoping that by paying attention to nutrition and the exercise components, that maybe my journey will be a little bit easier than hers was. Yes. I, I, I mean, hands down agree. And from, you know, what I've seen in my practice, what I've seen people, you know, turn around their symptoms and, and really feel a lot better. I, it works. Um, from what I learned in school, one of my most favorite classes was actually one of my Chinese medicine professors who talked all about menopause in, in China and, and Japan in particular, and how, it's so much of a culture to slow down, stop trying to do everything and juggle everything and really take the time to distress and take the time to eat nutritive tonic foods. And in particular, you know, I think the biggest thing we think about for folks who are already a little bit, you know, fit, I think a lot of us tend to overdo it because we think if, you know, less is, not less is more, we, we, we should have the concept of less is more, but now it's like more is more. Maybe it's the American society kind of think, well, you know, kind of supersize, you know, we have to do more exercise to get more results. And I see too many people <laughs> doing that, you know, in, in the backwards way of doing it, whereas the Asian professors were always just like, no, you need to, you know, this is your time to slow down, have fun, you know, really nourish yourself, don't overeat. I think that's another biggie I didn't mention about um, what's a big change for us as we get older is we don't need as much food. And a lot of people keep pounding the food at portions that they ate when they were 15, 16, 18. And <laughs> they do this at night, you know, Dinner being the biggest meal, that's another biggie. I should have mentioned this before about nutrition and menopause. Once you hit, and it's perimenopause, menopause, but really for my menopausal ladies, not saving dinner for your biggest meal because that'll jack with your hormones too and it'll cause you to have even worse hot flashes at night if your body's still trying to work with all those foods. And there might be food sensitivities and whatnot too because of leaky gut and whatever, but it's, it's the huge meals at night and huge portions that mess with gut bugs, but also can mess with sleep too. And so something else to think about that the Chinese, it's like one of the other things that besides taking care of yourself, not doing such intense exercise and focusing on mobility, which hula hooping is huge for in balance. Their other big thing was like, yeah, don't overload yourself with too much food. And so I really do like the, the Chinese aspect of balance, keeping balance. I love that. So that being said, I'm kind of thinking about back to hula hooping and bringing this whole conversation full circle for our guests because I I was just saying that concept of, of hula hooping and mobility and balance it's not just about exercise. There's so much more than that because just being able to move your core helps you with fluidity in your spine and, you know, helps keep you moving long term. 
And I think for a lot of folks, just kind of taking everything, you know, that we've talked about in terms of hormones and how, you know, having a exercise that works on your core and works on balance and is fun, I think it's just this great way to enter into your later stages in life embracing fun, going back to having, you know, embracing your five-year-old self, because I talk about that so hugely, because I think so many people forget about how to, how to have fun. I, I think that's I mean, there's, I can't tell you the reaction when people pick up a hoop. That's what I hear all the time. That was really, really fun. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And to your point about balance, I think one of the things that I try and emphasize when people do start waist hooping is to make sure that they're working both directions. Mm -hmm. you'll have one side that's easier, one current, one direction, however you want to refer to that, that feels really natural. And anything that's easy, we want to keep doing that, right? So we don't want to spin it in the opposite direction when it's harder. But to, cre to not do that is going to create some imbalances. And so practicing in both currents is super important. So if you spin it to the left, practice equal time spinning it to the right. And, you know, that'll really help with not not creating those imbalances. My goodness, I never would have thought about that. That's genius. I love it. Balance. Keeping the balance one way and the other throughout life. That's the name of the game. Well, <laughs> the reason that I thought about it initially, I mean, it's, it's intuitive when I mention it, right? But when I first started hooping, it wasn't intuitive to do that. And when I was working on that move of bringing the hoop up from waist to chest, you know, my obliques on one side were significantly different than my obliques on the other. And so, you know, working in both directions. And the other thing I would say is just giving yourself some time and space to not get it right. I mean, I think there's this fear of, oh, my goodness, I picked up a hoop and I didn't get it right the first time. I mean, so what? We're just used to having everything be instantaneous. You know, a text is instant, an email is almost instant. And so to have something where we're, we're working towards something, you know, you got to give yourself some grace and space to just let that happen. And I wish I had more video of myself in early on, you know, to be able to look back and say, wow, this has been really an incredible journey. It's not just about getting it right. I mean, when my dad died, that was my my way of coping with grief. I was out there. That's when I transitioned from one hoop to two hoops to three up to six very quickly because all of my energy was just put into these hoops. And so just giving yourself some some time and grace to experiment and kind of enjoy the journey because it is fun. It's just fun. I couldn't say it any better. I, I think that's I think that's the way to kind of embrace all of getting older is enjoying the journey and taking the time to appreciate things versus jumping in and trying to do everything fast, especially in terms of exercise world. I think there's just a lot to be said about taking time to learn the art of something. I love it. So with that being said, I am going to sign off for the podcast. So all of you out there, thank you for listening to another episode of The Health Click. Please leave us some comments. Let us know all about what you thought about this podcast. Go over to canyonhoops.com and anywhere else. Lee, is there anywhere else you want to drive them to? You want them to go get more information on you? Well, we did. We did create a special uh, discount for listeners of the podcast. So in the show notes, we'll put the coupon code. It's for 20% off. And so if they head to Canyon Hoops, they can apply that discount. And all of our hoops are great. I'll put my, my top pick in the show notes, and that should help people kind of narrow down a good, good starting fitness hoop. I'm totally going to jump on one because I have to do this. I need this in my office. I, I'm thinking about all my ladies, and I'm like, yeah, we need to get the hula hoops going in my waiting room. I've been thinking about ripping out all the chairs, like taking all the chairs out of my waiting room and just having a whole just bunch of games and things to play while hanging out. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs>
I am looking forward to it. So we thank you so much for allowing me to have you on the podcast and talking your ear off about all of my theories on heart exercise and hormones. Appreciate it. Oh my goodness. No, thank you for having me. I had I had a blast. I mean, I could spend all day talking about this stuff. So I mean, really, that was amazing. And I think I think we're going to give people a lot of good information. I sure hope so. I sure do. Well, clearly, we had some technical difficulties there. Lee was talking all about balance. And I think that's a great way to sum up today's podcast. Finding the right balance between exercise and stress management. And Hula Hoop's a great way to do that because I don't think I've ever seen anyone start using Hula Hoop and not smile because it brings us back to our childhood and goofing off. And I think that's important. We need to keep channeling childhood a little bit more and making life more fun. So Lee has offered for everyone that's listening to this podcast to head on over to canyonhoops.com and enter the health fix as your promo code. And you can get 20% off any hula hoop on her site. Now she's got a lot of great resources on her site, some great blog posts too. So I highly recommend going over there and checking it out because it'll change your mind about hula hooping. It's not just kids play. It's not just for ravers and folks dancing around, you know, with it. It is really, a, it can be a great exercise um, for you. So I think it's worth it to head on over to canyonhoops.com, see what Lee has to offer. She also has some courses there as well and is going to be coming out with more courses in the future. So stay tuned there with Lee Little. All right, Lee, thanks again. And thank you all for listening to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krauss. Head on over to my show notes at drjkrausnd.com if you want more information from this episode. Alrighty, have a great day, whatever you're doing. Hey everybody, Dr. Janine Krauss here. If you liked what you heard today, then head over to drjkrausnd.com to find my free resources and information to know when I post something new that's juicy that you might want to check out. Plus, head over to where you get your podcasts and like, subscribe, and write a review to help get the word out about me and help others at the same time to find me. It really does help, and I really appreciate all of your reviews.